Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for joining this Beyond Clean virtual event today. First off, I'd like to start by saying thank you on behalf of 3M, myself, my family, to all of our healthcare workers, for the job you do to keep us safe and healthy during this pandemic. You are a, the definition of a hero. Thank you. My presentation today will be in regards to vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization. Several of the systems I'll be talking about today have FDA EUA, or emergency use authorization, for the use in decontaminating N95 respirators. Although my presentation will not be specifically discussing EUAs and decontaminating N95 respirators, I think it's important to mention in the context of the pandemic that these are the same systems referenced in several FDA EUAs for decontaminating N95 respirators. My talk today will focus on sterilization and not decontamination using these systems. And also, I want to mention before I begin that 3M has a tremendous amount of resources on 3M's website regarding COVID-19 outbreak, information regarding masks, respirators, training videos, technical bulletin, and so much more. So please take advantage of 3M's website if you have questions. So let's begin. Of course, I have to begin with a disclosure. Um, name Larry Tuapa. I am employed at 3M. I do have pictures of 3M products in the presentation. I have my email here. Uh, more, more than welcome to email me anytime with any questions. We also have a 3M sterilization tech line where my colleague Kayla and Susan, Susan, I believe, who's speaking uh, up next, um, we answer this tech line regarding sterilization. Um, it can be regards standards, our products, uses, whatever. Whatever we can help you out in regards to sterilization, uh, please feel free to, to call that line so we can help. So learning objectives today. So today I want to review options available for vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization in healthcare facilities. I'm going to examine the basic chemistry of vaporized hydrogen peroxide. So who would know? You joined this Beyond Clean webinar today, and uh, you're going to learn some basic chemistry on hydrogen peroxide. Yes. Also, I'd like you to recognize and understand the sterilant levels reported on your sterilizer cycle printouts. So what we're going to do is combine some basic chemistry of hydrogen peroxide and see how it relates to the printout on your sterilizers. And then also look at what are the AMI and AON guidelines for monitoring sterilization with hydrogen peroxide. What do you, what do you need to do to release um, loads? And then at the end, I've got uh, some really interesting slides identifying clinical practices that we've seen in healthcare facilities in regards to hydrogen peroxide sterilization, that is not the best practice. Some things that you want to avoid. And what's nice about that whole section, it's just pictures, pictures we've gathered of, uh, of procedures or practices that may have kind of drifted over time outside uh, manufacturers' instructions for use. Fun facts. So yes, there are fun facts regarding hydrogen peroxide sterilization. It was discovered in 1818 by a French physicist named Fenard. I think what is extremely fascinating is that you can find hydrogen peroxide naturally. It's in milk. It's in honey. It's in ordinary tissues with normal cell function. You actually breathe out hydrogen peroxide in your breath. You actually also have it as part of your immune system. It's, in, it's part of phagocytosis where you have immune cells that are traveling through your body looking for foreign invaders, and they engulf them when they detect them. And in the part of engulfing them and destroying them, they use hydrogen peroxide. From an industrial application, it's been used in wastewater applications since 1970s. Um, a Steris, Steris VHP, the actual trademarked, copyrighted VHP, it, for their process that they developed in the mid-1980s, and that was primarily in the beginning there with the pharmaceutical companies and with aseptic processing. 
And then, of course, ASP uh, marketed the stair at 50 and got the 510K for that in U.S. health care facilities in 1999. So the table I have here to the right, it looks at the concentration of hydrogen peroxide. So I talk about fun facts with it. Um, what's important to know is, is the concentration that you're using the hydrogen peroxide at. So at the top there, contact lenses and over the counter, really, really uh, a low concentration. So I use hydrogen peroxide every night on my contacts. Uh, that's only at 3%. The concentration in the sterilizers in your healthcare facilities is significantly higher. And, and then that's where you've got to be concerned about the safety of using hydrogen peroxide. When you're looking at that concentration, the concentration that you're using it at in a healthcare facility is 58, 59%, and that's the liquid form that you're putting in the sterilizer. So um, really important to follow the warning in, in your operator's manuals in regards to the use of these sterilizers following uh, manufacturer's instructions for use. Because as a warning, I've just cut out of one of the things, hydrogen peroxide at this level is very, very corrosive. All right, so why, why do we use hydrogen peroxide sterilization in our healthcare facilities? Lots of the advantages, it's high efficacy, it's killing everything that we need to kill, all the microbes that we uh, understand could be on medical devices, uh, readily inactivate them and, and quickly. Uh, we have cycles now that are just minutes long, very fast, and I'll, I'll be talking about one of Steris's new VPro cycles, extremely quick, uh, cost effectiveness. Um, it, it's affordable. We can get it in our healthcare facilities with all uh, everything that's required for it, and, and, and um, we, we, again, we're being able to afford it. And then monitoring capabilities. You have to be able to monitor the cycle uh, to have it um, be used in healthcare facilities. And, and of course, what I mean by that, physically monitor it, chemically monitor it, and monitor it with a biological indicator. There are limitations. Uh, of materials compatibility, there are some, some materials are strictly off limits for hydrogen peroxide sterilization. One example is, is, is cellulose or anything made of paper or cellulose-based. Another limitation is adaptability. It's hard to get these sterilizers in very uh, um, big chambers, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well, but you don't see very walk-in size, cart size uh, chambers for hydrogen peroxide sterilization. Uh, penetrability, I'm trying to get hydrogen peroxide down very long lumens and nooks and crevices. And crevices. We all understand uh, when, when we're sterilizing endoscopes with hydrogen peroxide sterilization, we got to know the length of the channels or lumens that we're sterilizing and the inner diameter of those. So that's part of penetrability. You understand the restrictions and what cycles you need to use for your specific endoscopes of, of a certain length and inner diameter of channels. Uh, organic material resistance, the limitations, so meaning can you sterilize through dirt? Uh, pretty much all sterilization modalities have some organic material resistance. Uh, toxic. Uh, yes, it's a, it, it's a chemical. It's hydrogen peroxide, as I mentioned in the previous slide. It's toxic and has um, OSHA limits um, for what you could be exposed to in your permissible uh, exposure limits. And then technique sensitive. So technique sensitive. So the user, the operator of that sterilizer, the one loading the sterilizer, that technique that they use, that sterilizer is technique sensitive, meaning the user or the operator can significantly affect the outcome of the process. And that's a lot of what I want to talk about today. How does the user and the operator that's running that sterilizer, how can they uh, significantly affect the outcome of the process? And that's technique sensitive. So let's look at the available options today in healthcare facilities in regards to having a 510K clearance from the FDA for sterilization of reusable devices. So first off, um, we have advanced sterilization products or ASPs. Um, a lot of a lot of a lot of um, users call these uh, plasma sterilizers, and it's the Sterad 100F, the Sterad NX, and the Sterad 100NX. And you can see in the NX versions, they have also their new all clear version that that's a different a form and fashion and slightly different in the conditioning of the cycles. Um, 
Of course, you may or may not be aware that the Stairhead 100F it will be con discontinued. Um, they have a letter out there that the that, that the useful life of that sterilizer is, is 20 cycles. And then I had mentioned the next generation of the NX is, is called the All Clear technology. And Steris, so Steris has their uh, Steris Z Pro family. Um, they call them Z Pros. Um, it's interesting the way they uh, developed and marketed their sterilizers. Uh, they started off with the Z Pro One that I have here in the slide. And then from the V Pro 1, they had one cycle. V Pro 1 Plus added the next cycle. V Pro Max added a third cycle. And then the V Pro Max 2 has a fourth cycle. And I had mentioned um, very fast non lumen cycle on the Max 2 down to 16 minutes. So claims of a 16 minute sterilization cycle. So hydrogen peroxide can be very fast and effective. And then also in January of 2019, they uh, Steris cleared the VPro uh, S2. As you can see here, it's a, a mid-range version in between the VPro 60 and the uh, VPro uh, Max family. Uh, four cycles on that one, with one of the fast cycles being only 19 minutes. We also have some other players in the market. We have Sterilucent. Um, Sterilucent has a 510K clearance on their PSD85 sterilizer, and, and the way they market it on their website is a combat uh, uh, hospitals use of hydrogen peroxide sterilization. You can kind of see how it sits there. Um, it, it, it actually, the legs are, are part of the box that you can fold it up and, and of course, transport it easily. But very recently, in September of 2019, they had 510K clearance for a tabletop hydrogen peroxide sterilizer that would be useful uh, uh, in healthcare facilities. It has three cycles. It has a dynamic sterilet delivery and continuous uh, sterilet monitoring. So a little bit uh, more advanced uh, um, technology around the monitoring of the cycle um, with this uh, uh, new sterilizer by Sterilucent. And then, of course, we also have the Sterizone or the VP4, which, you, which uses hydrogen peroxide and ozone, um, which was originally developed and, and designed uh, by TSO3 in Quebec, Canada. And it was recently, the company and the sterilizer was recently uh, purchased by Stryker. So, how do these cycles work? Uh, they pretty much, um, the cycles on each one of these sterilizers pretty much work the same way. We've got a very general outline here from the Steris V Pro Lumen cycle. They all evacuate all the air out of the chamber using very, very deep vacuum. So we need a very deep vacuum in these processes uh, because hydrogen peroxide as a vapor or as a gas in these processes is relatively unstable. And I'll, I'll talk more about that. So they start off with a very, very a deep vacuum to remove the air um, and, and res any residual moisture. You're probably all aware that when you're, you have your devices and you load through these processes, you got to make sure that they're dry, uh, um, dry for manufacturer's instructions for use, or else you could potentially get a cancellation of the cycle. Um, once you have a deep vacuum, hydrogen peroxide is ejected. And, and this is a static with no makeup, so you take a, a specific volume and it's injected in for each load, no matter if it's a small load or a large load. Um, um, and again, that amount is depending on the type of cycle and the technology you're using. Now, the new Sterilucent one that I had mentioned just previously, the newest one on the market by Sterilucent, that one has a little bit dynamic injection of hydrogen peroxide, so it may inject more or less during this phase. And then also the Sterizone VP4. Um, they too will also use a little bit of dynamic injecting depending on the conditions of the load. Um, from there, these, these cycles vent to atmosphere. As you can see those pulses that you can see in the chart here that are, are kind of like spikes. Uh, that's deliberately allowing air into the chamber, rising the pressure inside of the chamber, which helps uh, deliver the hydrogen peroxide deeper into crevices and nooks and down channels and inside the packaging and then also preps it, prepares it for the next injection. And then this is repeated for, depending on the number of injections for each cycle. 
Um, Steris has cycles where they have four injections of hydrogen peroxide. So you can see the example in the diagram. You can see uh, four injections there. Uh, Steris also has cycles where they only have two injections. Um, the cycles for ASP and the steroid systems, uh, they use two injections. So example here of the 100F, we pull down in the beginning here. This is a pressure profile. So what the pressure is doing inside of the chamber over time. Very deep vacuum is pulled. Um, in the 100F, they use a plasma. So of course, you, you know, the steroid systems are like a plasma sterilizer, or you call them your plasma sterilizer. Um, here, there's an air plasma that helps uh, warm up the load, condition the chamber, and help remove moisture. And then there's a vent up to atmosphere, and then a very deep vacuum. And then hydrogen peroxide is injected, then a vent or diffusion up to atmosphere that help penetrate and dry that hydrogen peroxide, and then, then another vacuum down after the injection, and then a plasma is ignited. We need a very, very deep vacuum to ignite that plasma, and that's where you get your gas plasma. So they ignite a plasma inside the chamber with the hydrogen uh, peroxide, and the term gas plasma, and that also prepares the cycle for the next injection of hydrogen peroxide, and the cycle continues on as it did in the beginning. So as you can see here, there are two injections of hydrogen peroxide for the steroid 100 s How do we get the hydrogen peroxide into these sterilizers? Well, there's, like I'd mentioned, fixed volume injections. You can use a single dose capsules, as you can see ASP up here. They're cassettes or ca capsules that are, 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 are placed in with cassettes. There's a multi-use cup here to the right. That's for the Ceres V Pro systems. Um, they still use uh, a fixed amount, but they just draw hydrogen peroxide from that cup multiple times. Uh, the Ceres VP, excuse me, the Striker Sterizone VP4 uses a bottle, and you can see the bottle that's placed down here, and that will draw, again, based upon how much uh, is needed for that type of load that was used. And then there's a multi-use disc. Um, the Sterilucent uses a, a disc to get the uh, liquid hydrogen peroxide uh, into the chamber so it can be used and for the process for vaporizing. So one thing that's important to note, um, all these technologies, when it's in exposure, well, during the exposure phase, uh, uh, it's static. There's no additional injection into the chamber. So depending on what that load is and conditions and the materials and what you've placed in there um, will all be affected during that exposure phase uh, of the hydrogen peroxide, which is very much unlike steam, which I'll talk about in the next few slides. So with that, we'll talk a little bit about that basic chemistry. I know you guys are just anxious to get to basic chemistry of hydrogen peroxide sterilization, and that's just part of it. Presentation. So example, hydrogen peroxide sterilate concentration levels. So the, the amount of hydrogen peroxide in the chamber, it, it's like how much is it, what's the sterilate? So we know hydrogen peroxide is a sterilate, and we can talk about the concentration of it, but some sterilizers work with lower concentration, and some sterilizers work with higher concentration. And we'll, so what does that mean? And so I've used this diagram here. It's a very a simple diagram. Lower concentration means you just have less molecules of that hydrogen peroxide. So lower concentration, just a fewer molecules in that chamber space. Higher concentration has a larger number or more molecules in the same chamber space. Lower concentration of sterilant, lower number of molecules. Higher concentration of sterilant, higher number of molecules. And what I think is fascinating to think about, especially if you're a user and you're loading this, your, your, your reusable medical devices in that chamber uh, and sterilizing every day, those hydrogen peroxide molecules that are injected in the chamber, they must contact every surface of that device to achieve sterilization. They have to contact it, contact it in a significant concentration over time on every single surface. Uh, it's pretty fascinating if you think about it in detail. You're trying to get a molecule to attach and contact every single surface to achieve sterilization for that entire device. So with that, with that brief description of low concentration of high concentration, you may or may not be aware 
that the sterilizers that we have in U.S. healthcare facilities all operate at different concentrations. All are using a different amount of hydrogen peroxide to achieve the same goal of sterilization of the medical devices. On the left-hand side of this chart, we have the Sterad 100S that has one of the lowest concentrations of hydrogen peroxide, around 6 to 7 milligrams per liter. And if we move over to the Steris V-Pros, a little bit higher concentration, around 9 or 10 milligrams per liter. And then when we get to the ASP Sterad version, the NX versions, uh, an estimated 25 to 28 milligrams per liter of hydrogen peroxide, significantly more in this technology and of the same company that had the ASB steroid 100S at a lower concentration of hydrogen peroxide. A little more on the chemistry of hydrogen peroxide and how these systems work. So I mentioned where we don't have makeups during exposure for hydrogen peroxide. I want to compare that to steam. So if I've got an example of a steam sterilization cycle here with temperature and steam, on the left-hand side and cycle time over time, we know when we start up the cycle, we're doing pulses and conditioning with the steam and sterilates itself. So we're pulsing in steam and, and, and vacuuming it out, pulse it in, vacuum out, pulse it in, in a pre-vacuum dynamic air removal cycle. And as we do that, to so the diagram here to the left, we're injecting up to the exposure conditions. And once we're in those exposure conditions, Steam is constantly injected in depending if it's needed or not. So during exposure of those steam sterilate conditions, steam is continuously injected in. You can hear sterilate. So if, it, if the steam condenses and it drops too low in temperature or pressure, the sterilizer injects more steam. If it gets too hot, then it holds it for a while and maintains it. So there's always a continual injection of steam during that, for example, four minutes of exposure at a 270 cycle. Now, this is significantly different for hydrogen peroxide. So the example here on the right-hand side with the pink curves, hydrogen peroxide, the fixed amount is injected in, or the amount that's dynamically injected for that load is injected into a certain point, and then when it's held during exposure, it depletes. It depletes, and there are several reasons why, but it doesn't maintain it at a specified level like we would for steam. It continuously depletes and depletes and depletes. Now, if it depletes too much, your cycle will cancel. If it depletes too much, you could have failed monitoring products. Hydrogen peroxide is considered a relatively unstable molecule, and it will deplete during that exposure phase for several reasons, and I'll go through that in the next few slides. Even when you have multiple injections, so I've got a second injection here, and I inject it up. That's that second graph that's in the pink. It'll get up to a point. And then once it's during hell, during exposure, it's depleting and depleting and depleting. Again, if that breakdown and that depletion is significant, you could have a canceled cycle or you could have a failed uh, monitoring product. A little bit again of how you could have a failed cycle. So an empty chamber, nothing in the load, inject hydrogen peroxide, it's naturally going to deplete down in that load. And if it doesn't deplete too much, like an empty chamber, it doesn't get to the point here where it's going to cancel. But if, but if it was a fully loaded and, and possibly not loaded correctly, it can inject and it's deplete at a more significant rate with that full load. And potentially, if it depletes below a level that's predetermined by the sterilizer, it can cancel the cycle or potentially fail a monitoring product or tool that you're using for um, monitoring of your cycle. So why is it? So with more basic chemistry, what happens with hydrogen peroxide? Well, it can either absorb, absorb, decompose, or condense during the cycle. And this is important. As a user, as someone that's loading the sterilizer, you have to follow manufacturer's instructions for use because of this um, uh, a depletion during this exposure phase in hydrogen peroxide because of these factors of the basic chemistry of hydrogen peroxide and also because there's no makeup of the sterilant during exposure. So absorption, uh, that's when molecules become penetrate and get stuck inside materials or packaging uh, uh, of the devices. So here we've got an example here of a load of hydrogen peroxide and I've got my load inside the chamber. What happens with absorption 
and hopefully can see it, is it all just sucks right into the load, and, and it's not available for actually sterilization of the devices where too much of it is taken out of the environment for sterilization, but it's absorbed into the load. Next one, adsorption. So adsorption is where hydrogen peroxide molecules gather in clumps or layers and stick to the surfaces of instruments and packaging. So I've got my empty chamber of hydrogen peroxide molecules kind of floating around here, and I've got a shelf in the middle. Now I put in my packaging with my, my illustrated device in the middle. And then what is adsorption? Adsorption, again, is these molecules, they're sticking on the surface of your devices, your materials, and, 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 it's, and taking it away from uh, sterilization. Decomposition. So decomposition. Decomposition for hydrogen peroxide molecules fall apart more rapidly into water and oxygen after contacting some surfaces. All right, so now I've got my chamber here again of hydrogen peroxide molecules floating around. I have my load. With inside the load there, I've got um, my devices in the load. And what happens is, depending on the materials and what that is, it can decompose. And what it does is it breaks down the hydrogen peroxide goes to water and oxygen. Again, uh, uh, removing it as part of the sterilant for sterilizing. And you can actually, as I've got here in the bottom, you can balance that equation for the amount of hydrogen peroxide moles and, and water and oxygen that's created during decomposition. Condensation. We all know what condensation is. So if you take a cold glass of water and take it out to a hot, humid environment, that hot, humid environment, the, the, the moisture in the air will condense when it hits the cold glass of water. So the cold air cannot hold as much water as warm air, and there's cold air around your glass of water, so that water inside the warm air condenses out. And the same thing can happen with vaporized hydrogen peroxide in these processes used in healthcare facilities. If you're putting in a cold load and that load is still significantly cooler when it gets the vaporization of hydrogen peroxide, you can get condensation of that hydrogen peroxide. So an example here, we have the um, chamber full of hydrogen peroxide floating around. We put in our packages loaded with devices and essentially the molecules of hydrogen peroxide will, will condense in, in pool in, in certain areas uh, in the packaging and the load, uh, removing that hydrogen peroxide potentially as a source of, um, of sterilant. Right. So all of these, all of the basic chemistry is why that depletes during that exposure phase and why it's really important for the user to understand what they're loading and understanding manufacturers for use and um, assuring you don't drift uh, from good practices. Now, your sterilizers on the cycle printout will have a measurement of this. So let's look at the cycle printouts to understand the measurement that the sterilizer has and acts upon and use a user can review to understand what's going on with some of your common loads that you're sterilizing in, in these processes. For the uh, Sterad uh, 100F, uh, very common uh, uh, sterilizer out in healthcare facilities, on the cycle printout, that measurement of the amount of hydrogen peroxide in the chamber at the end of the exposure phase is called the injection stage pressure. And you can see it very clearly on the cycle printout. It's the injection stage pressure one and injection stage uh, pressure two. A lower value of this number equates to a lower amount of hydrogen peroxide remaining at the end of exposure. And this value can correspond to cycle failures uh, with a positive BI. Okay. Another little point or tip for the 100S, if there's any red text here where I've outlined on the cycle printout to the left, uh, most likely some kind of error code or something that the user should be uh, notified of. So let's look at this injection stage pressure a little, a little bit more. All right, so we've got numbers here that you can look at. And what do these numbers really equate to? So again, empty chamber, hydrogen peroxide injected in. Uh, hydrogen peroxide is going to deplete during the process, as you can see in this curve. But here at this point, here is the injection stage pressure point where it takes a measurement. If this point had dropped too low, for an example, 
in a fully loaded chamber here to the right, you're getting very significantly to a point where the cycle could cancel. Because there's a point where this curve dropped too low, the cycle will cancel. Or it's a potentially you could be on the borderline. You could be on a risk of failing. Or you could be getting a monitoring product that was failing because your loads are always hovering right around that borderline. So let me talk a little bit about that in a, a different type of context. So if I'm looking at injection stage pressures, um, don't run on empty. Don't run your cycles in that 100S or these hydrogen peroxide sterilizers to the point where they're always very close to potentially um, canceling. So, so what do I mean by that? So I've got my little example here. I've got a motorcycle and I've got a tank of gas. And if I got a full tank of gas or fuel, can I ride 30 miles and get to my house? Well, most likely I can. I'm going to get 30 miles on that full tank in that motorcycle because I'm not running on empty. I've got a full tank. I've got everything I need to run, drive the distance, ride the distance that I need to. But what if I'm on empty? What if I'm always pushing this at, at, at the limits here? I got a, a tank fuel on empty. Can I go to those 30 miles to get home on empty? Well, Sometimes I can, but there's a lot of different variables. The daily performance of the bike, quality of fuel, driving speed, the weight of the bike, the environmental elevation of the road, pressure of the tires. I got a lot of different things that are affecting me on there. So sometimes I can get there on an empty tank, get home, but sometimes I can't. It all depends upon different variables, several different variables. And so you know what? I can take that in the same way as injection stage pressures in your sterilizer. All right? If you're always running right on the edge, sometimes you're going to be successful and pass and everything's good, but sometimes you're going to fail and, and, and see monitoring products that fail or the cycle itself uh, will cancel. So I've got examples here in this diagram. Six injection stage pressure is the cancellation point um, for uh, or the 100S, and and what are these variables I'm talking about? At higher injection stage pressures, all my BIs and CIs are going to pass. So if I'm keeping it up high and it's not depleting, it's all going to pass and be successful. But if what happens when I load it up? I got sterilizer performance. I got weight of the load, which is significant. A material composition of the load. I have the CS environment. I got dryness of the devices and design of the devices in the load, all of that load, depending on what the operator places in, it starts consuming up all my sterilants that I'm going to use for sterilizing the devices. So all of that drops. Do the CIs and BIs pass? Sometimes they pass and everything is successful and we're good. Um, sometimes we fail. Again, it depends on the variable. Sometimes you pass, sometimes you fail, but not always because all of these variables will line up. All right, what we want to do is, is, is improve the performance, decrease the load size, confirm the materials, maybe a warmer CS environment, increase dryness, which will then will get your injection stage pressures with a much higher probability of success. Again, if we're looking at this, higher sense of failure, more risk of failure by pushing it down to that cycle load. You can also look at this on your VPRO cycle printout, um, the VPRO. For the cycles that have four injections, they have them on the cycle printout here as well, and you can look at them. Um, they actually have limits between 6.3 to 15. Uh, so you can look at those on your cycle printouts. What are the loads that you're commonly using? What are they happening uh, during the process? So an example here um, in the VPRO that I actually did at a facility, um, in this specific load with this specific devices and uh, uh, sterilizer and packaging, sometimes they pass. Sometimes they failed, and they weren't too sure what was going on. We went on site, did a little study. That's something that you could do in your facility. We did an empty chamber to look at the injection stage pressures, and this is the column to the right. We did it um, with just the trays and no devices and got injection stage pressures, and then we compared that to the fully loaded chamber that sometimes they were passing and sometimes that they were failing. And you can graph it out and see what's occurring. You look at the empty chamber with nothing in there, you can see the injection stage pressures are really high. But then you go down here and just have the empty trays, 
you can see how much just the trays themselves were depleting the hydrogen peroxide. And then you add in the device, you can see they were running very close to uh, failing sometimes, but passing other times. Again, experiment you can do in your own facility if you're that you're seeing failures. So an example here, um, may or may not know, Steris has a new ProLite sterilization trays for their systems. I would imagine that they um, um, are, are helpful in this whole an analogy that I'm talking about here, where in this example, if I go backwards, the tray was having a significant effect on the injection stage pressures. Uh, potentially, in this scenario, you could change the trays. All right, the Sterad technology, they also have a measurement. So the Sterad technology, the NX technology, also has a measurement called area under the curve, which is this area of of integrating the hydrogen peroxide over time. So the area under the curve is useful for monitoring the sterilization process as it integrates two important process variables, hydrogen peroxide vapor concentration and exposure time into a single index. And these cycles and these technologies actually have a, a, a hydrogen peroxide sensor. Um, you may or may not be aware of it. You actually should be aware, aware of it if you're using these sterilizers because it's really important not to block this lens here at the bottom of the chamber um, that I've got in the diagram. There's a mercury lamp um, that delivers UV light down to this diode at the bottom of the chamber. So you can imagine this light being there during the exposure time. And the molecules of gas that pass through that light, they use that monitor to, to generate how many molecules of hydrogen peroxide are in the chamber over integrated over the exposure time to get you what's called the area under the curve. So really important not to block this diode at the bottom here with your load because when it gets into the exposure phase and it detects it can't monitor the hydrogen peroxide, it will cancel the cycle. Um, many of you may have had that, um, that effect um, in process in, in your facility, and so that's why it happens. If you block that diode, they can't monitor the hydrogen peroxide in these processes. In the Sterad NX, so the Sterad NX version of the sterilizers, you can get this value in the medium cycle printout. I've got it highlighted here. It's a rather long printout, but they put it there, and you can look at it and understand what's going on with your loads and your cycles. Are you running on the edge there or not? And you can see how different loads affect this value on are you on the edge of failing or not, and that's called the HCO2 area as depicted in this diagram. And then also on the Sterad 100 NX, you can see it right there on the short report. Um, these are just examples. Here's the standard cycle and the flex cycle. Um, you can see it's uh, inside the uh, my presentation here. I've seen some formatting that's kind of maybe part of the presentation to the webinar. It doesn't come up very well. Um, but a but lot higher injection stage, excuse me, a lot higher AUCs for a standard cycle and a flex cycle uh, because exposure times are longer. Um, the express cycle with a relatively shorter exposure time having a, 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 a lower amounts of AUC. Again, AUC, same thing. If you can improve all of this, the sterilizer performance, reduce the load, making sure you're putting in the correct material composition, your CS environment as per the operating instructions installation, device dryness has a thing, and the device of your device, uh, making sure you're using good practices for all of these, you can reduce your AUCs and not get down to a point where you could potentially have failures in that process. So options for monitoring. So how do we monitor these cycles for sterilization in our healthcare facilities? Right? What guidelines do we use? For STEAM, as you know, you have ST79 for Amy. For hydrogen peroxide, we have ST58, chemical sterilization, a high-level disinfection in healthcare facilities. And of course, ARN guidelines per practice 2019, the guidelines for sterilization under specifically uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide. So that's where we get our guidelines for monitoring these processes. And of course, in the ST58, you got to have your physical monitors, which is your cycle printout, your chemical indicators, which are your internal chemical indicators, and your, uh, your tapes externally, and your 
biological indicators. So, of course, uh, like steam, physical monitors for hydrogen peroxide, your time, temperature, pressure recorders, digital printouts, and gauges. Um, the printout should be verified. Um, I would be looking at your hydrogen peroxide measurement depending on what type of technology sterilizer that you are using to understand what's going on in your process and how you're loading, how close you are to potentially failing. Um, of course, and also look at your cycle identification number, end of the cycle, examine, interpret, and verify cycle parameters have been met. What I think is interesting, um, I love this quote from Amy SD58, physical monitoring and other indicators of sterilizer performance should never be considered a substitute for careful adherence to prescribed packaging and loading procedures. So everything that I've mentioned in the last 45 minutes is we're trying to impress on you. Just because the sterilizer cycle prints out that everything is fine, um, there is a, a lot of technique to using these sterilizers and a lot of technique to using the, the newest rapid biological indicators on the market can pick up some of these drifts and practices nowadays. And we do documented this in AB SD58. Um, physical monitoring is not the only thing here. You have to head, adhere to prescribed packaging and loading procedures because you can still see failures that a physical monitoring is not going to pick up. Amy SD58 for quality control. I uh, recommend, uh, uh, of course, for exposure control, an external CI on every packaging. Uh, a CI should be used on the outside of each package unless an internal uh, indicator is, is visible. Recommended for pack control, an internal CI inside every package tray, containment with device, cassette, or instrument trays. Um, the CI should be placed in the area of the packet or tray or containment with device that creates the greatest challenge to sterile penetration. Again, looks like the little formatting in the slides messed up a little bit. Can't see everything with the CIs there, but I um, was able to read it out to you. Biological indicators for Amy FC58. Of course, biological indicators are intended to demonstrate whether the conditions were adequate to achieve sterilization. And for Amy SD58, a PCD with the appropriate BI should also be used at least daily, but preferably in every sterilization cycle, and in each load containing an implantable device. So ARN, under low temperature hydrogen peroxide sterilization, vapor, gas plasma combination, 2019, uh, under some of their specifics for hydrogen peroxide, geobacillus sterophilomopus biological indicators. Um, for reaching load release, they also look at sterilizer efficacy monitoring and sterilizer qualification testing. And they say for a BI, you should be using a BI containing a quality monitoring product uh, used per instructions for use. A little bit different than Amy that says a PCD, ARN now has drifted to practices for a BI containing quality monitoring product used for IFU. And then I've got highlighted here, which I'll also talk about in the next slide, routine BI testing at least daily on each cycle type, but preferably with each load for these processes. Just kind of summar summarize it, the modality, hydrogen peroxide sterilization, any PCD with a BI daily, but preferably every cycle. ARN is a BI containing quality monitoring product used per IFU, at least daily on each cycle type, preferably with each load. So, oh, also quality control. Of course, uh, a daily control BI. So every day that you're putting a BI into that sterilizer, you should have a positive control biological indicator um, that's used for the same lot and in the same incubator. If you have multiple incubators, each incubator should have a positive control, again, of the same lot um, for each day that you're putting a BI inside that sterilizer. And then, of course, acceptance criteria for releasing loads for Amy SG58, negative result from the test BI, positive result from the control BI, appropriate reasons from physical monitors, and the CI with the appropriate um, endpoints and control. So for the next uh, 15 minutes here, um, the last part of the presentation, we want to identify clinical practices that adversely affect 
the outcome of vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization in healthcare facilities. So we've been working very, very closely uh, with healthcare facilities for several years now with hydrogen peroxide sterilization, and we've captured some common practices that have drifted uh, from appropriate manufacturer's instructions for use. We've captured some of the common ones here to assure that you also don't fall into this pitfall or drift in practices that could result over time in failures of the cycle or your uh, monitoring practices. So first off, the 100S, it seems like we work with the 100S, uh, the Sterad, um, ASP Sterad 100S uh, most, option, uh, uh, most often in, in 3M. It has a one cycle option uh, today in the US. The standard cycle runs about 55 minutes. Um, it seems to be the most common hydrogen peroxide sterilizer used in the U.S. It has one of the lowest concentrations of hydrogen peroxide or, or sterilant uh, used during the exposure uh, uh, time. Uh, of course, what I meant, you know, concentration, lowest concentration is, is the least amount of molecules injected uh, for sterilizing uh, of the load. Um, there is not a weight limit defined. I didn't talk a lot about weight limits in this presentation. I do in other presentations, but all of your hydrogen peroxide cycles out there are FDA cleared with a maximum weight limit. You should know and understand the weight of the load that you're putting in for each cycle type, and each cycle type has a different weight limit. So you cannot exceed that weight limit because that's also going to push you over the edge and potentially fail over time. So understand the weight limit of the load that you're putting in for each cycle type. Now, the Steroid 100S has been on the market for quite a long time, and at the time that it was FDA cleared, that weight limit was not defined. And then, of course, if you're, if you're using the new Rapid BIs on the market by all the manufacturers, these Rapid BIs are, are, are more resistant than the standard visual uh, conventional readout BIs, and, and potentially... Uh, um, if your practices have drifted over time with the 100S, you could be seeing uh, failures with these biological indicators. Um, practices need to come back in in line with manufacturer's instructions for use, which we may need uh, like a, a change in long-term behavior if it's been a long time where practices have drifted in a particular facility, and now you're using a rapid biological indicator that's uh, more resistant than the conventional BIs on the market for many, many years, uh, may have to look at your practices once again. And of course, overloading. So examples here that I have. Example here to the left. This example overloaded for a 100S. The items should be laying flat. They shouldn't be touching each other. They shouldn't be aggressing over to the sides of the chamber in that Faraday cage. You shouldn't be touching there. As you can see here, this one is it is overloaded. It was causing um, uh, failures at a particular facility. Um, good practice here is get an inch in between or, 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 or be able to slide your hand like a karate chop in between each package, making sure there's space for air removal and sterile penetration. This container here in the middle pictured example, overweight. Look at your container manufacturer's IFU. There's a weight limit for what you can place inside the container and potentially a weight limit of the load using these containers. This particular one example only can have seven pounds, including the total container. And this investigator here found it was 8.4 pounds. And they were putting four of these in the Sterad 100S, way overweight. Uh, for that Sterad 100S with that particular container for that cycle. Each container will have limits for the cycle and the technology or the model used. Uh, mats, uh, uh, just a word of caution and warning with rubber mats. Some rubber mats in the market can absorb, absorb a lot of hydrogen peroxide. In this example, these mats were not labeled for use in hydrogen peroxide. Make sure the mats that you're using are appropriate um, for the process. This transport tray, you may all be using these transport tray, but they should not be placed inside the hydrogen peroxide sterilizer. Of course, only if it's labeled. I haven't seen any of these labeled for use inside hydrogen peroxide. Make sure that that doesn't go in. Uh, da Vinci 
So if you're sterilizing da Vinci, the endoscopes that go with da Vinci, the SI or the XI, the example here is it's overloaded. So the da Vinci XI, as you can see, is the top item here on the tray, very large item if you're sterilizing it in hydrogen peroxide, which 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 which, which is the common method for these endoscopes, um, can only be the only item in the 100S. And you can see in this process in this uh, facility they were putting other items inside the sterilizer with it um, that is not appropriate. Another example here, we have found this in, in several occasions where the lid and bottom uh, of containers are mismatched. Mitch They're not the correct lid for the bottom or the container. The bottom is not for, correct for the top. You can look at it either way. And they were not labeled for hydrogen peroxide, and it was actually over the limit for the process uh, weight limit for what it was labeled for. Um, we've seen materials and cables not even designed for chemical sterilization as the example here. And these trays, um, you may or may not be using these trays from Carl's stores. Um, they are not compatible with hydrogen peroxide. Please look at your trays, the types that you're using. Even if you've been doing it for years, um, call the manufacturer of that packaging and determine through IFU if it's appropriate for hydrogen peroxide sterilization because we run across that quite often. Again, uh, a tray not labeled for hydrogen peroxide sterilization. Example here to the left, device not labeled for hydrogen peroxide, the entire thing. Um, da Vinci SI, the example pictured here to the right. If you read the Da Vinci SI IFU, you should not be putting in your cables or your, uh, uh, I believe it's called light cords. I have another term for, for SI, but they should not be packaged along with the SI. Um, that's not that's not appropriate. Another one, that's Therad 100S. If you look at this configuration here, you should know right away. Looking at this configuration, it's the same. It's the same configuration. It's the same load or packaging. But you should know right away that this is not appropriate. And why this is not appropriate? Do not stack instrument trays inside of trays. Do not stack trays. Do not stack trays within trays right out of the operator's manual. We saw this as being placed in a 100S. It should tell you right away you should not be second trays with inside trays for hydrogen peroxide um, sterilization. Again, the notes continue. Again, this is a cut and paste out of the operator's manual for Sterad 100S. Do not stack in instruments inside containers. Do not stack containers. Do not stack containers with inside containers. Do not wrap instruments within containers. If you're, you're doing this process at your facility in a 100S and against the operator's manual, you should be aware of that uh, right away when you see this kind of configuration. Next, the Sterad uh, NX Express Cycle. So another one we get a lot of calls on and we help with facilities out a lot with this cycle um, because it has one of the shortest exposure times on the market. Um, another kind of nuance to this, if you're using the express cycle, you can only load the bottom shelf. So only the bottom shelf is validated for this express cycle. And that bottom shelf has a weight limit. That weight limit is only 10.7 pounds. So even if you are just using it on the bottom shelf, are you limiting yourself to only 10.7 pounds? Because that's what the sterilizer manufacturer has validated and cleared through the US FDA. So let's look at some examples. Well, very clearly here, if you're using the express cycle, this one's a violation in the fact that you're loading um, um, on the top shelf. It should only be the bottom shelf. Unfortunately, this configuration with the Da Vinci SI, we see failures in some facilities with this, and we dig into it, uh, it's overweight. This whole configuration with the insert inside the large metal container with two SIs, um, the configuration is greater than 10.7 pounds, which has been validated uh, for the sterilizer manufacturer through the US FDA for that express cycle. Um, this is overweight, this configuration. It's, it's much greater than 10.7 pounds. Uh, the Da Vinci XI, so Da Vinci XI can be sterilized in the steroid express cycle per their Da Vinci XI IFU. But what's important to note, when you're monitoring this cycle with a BI, assure that the BI in the pouch is not occluded. Um, in this case here, it's easy to, because you've got to monitor the express cycle in the rear of the sterilizer with your BI, it's easy to place this whole XI on top of the BI. It's easy to push the BI off the shelf into the bottom of it. 
pin it up against the back here so assure that it's not occluded um, when you're using this uh, configuration XI and express cycle. Here's the other one here. This is XI in the metal uh, 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 um, tray that's per IFU. But if you're using that XI in the express cycle with the metal cycle, um, the weight of the wrap has got to be 400 weight or less. And this is for the DaVinci XI IFU. We can also look at the V-Pro and see some of the same. The uh, DaVinci in the V-Pro, DaVinci XI should be the only item in the chamber. Um, it should not be anything else if you're doing DaVinci XI. Have to be aware of the lumen cycle in the V-Pro. The Ceres V-Pro has a weight limit. We've seen that lumen cycle overloaded where the uh, users weren't aware of the weight limit for that particular cycle. And then, of course, we have seen this example here in Z-Pro as well. Look at to the set to the right. This whole set was not labeled for hydrogen peroxide. It was only steam compatible. Um, unfortunately, this facility was doing this unknowingly uh, for many, many, for a while. Um, but again, you can see not compatible for hydrogen peroxide sterilization because it's a tray inside of a tray. That should also be a warning to at least review it and say, is this appropriate for hydrogen peroxide? Because I got a tray inside a tray, and that is really not a commonly uh, 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 configuration that's acceptable in these processes. Other clinical examples um, for the Steroid 100NX: 10.7 uh, pounds per shelf, not for just the whole thing. So the the this standard and flex cycle allow you 10.7 for each shelf, but this example here is way overloaded. As you can see, this is much more than 10.7 pounds for that shelf. Maybe look at this configuration in the NX. Take a look at it real quick. What's going on here? Why well, they put an extra tray in here? See this bottom tray they put on? Not sure why that was going on there, but for some reason they thought they would put this tray in here as well. This whole tray wasn't labeled. So think of what I was talking about earlier in the presentation, absorption, absorption. You got a material in here, a tray, not labeled for hydrogen peroxide, probably soft, rubbery, absorbing some of that sterilant and taking it away as part of the sterilization of the devices. Make sure your pouches are labeled for hydrogen peroxide. This particular pouch at the time we looked at it, not labeled for hydrogen peroxide. Um, respect pouches, because pouches can be complex. Pouch, pouches, yes, can be a Tyvek material, but the Tyvek can have different density. The Tyvek can be coated. And then you have the plastic side of the pouch. That plastic side can be different thicknesses. It can be different materials. And then what's the third item of a pouch? The adhesive. The adhesive that keeps them all together, they can have different adhesives. So you got to make sure your pouch has been tested and labeled for hydrogen peroxide sterilization because all these components can be different in different pouches. Some more items, just a couple more slides here, and then we're coming up here to the top of the hour. Some other examples. Uh, routine efficacy testing done in, done in the empty chamber. No, routine efficacy testing with the BI should be done in a fully loaded chamber. Now, I am on the, the, the committee for Amy SP58. It is up and currently being revised, and it's one of the comments that we put in. It's not clear in Amy SP58 that it should be a loaded chamber for BI. Um, testing, but BI testing, because you're looking at some of these practices and your load, your BI testing, your routine efficacy monitoring should be with the loaded chamber. Um, example for BIs, again, in this middle one here, no extra labels on any of the BIs. Read the instructions for use for your BIs. You shouldn't be putting extra labels in. We found this one here, this example, there is an extra label placed right on this BI, and that's, that's where the air is removed from the BI and the sterilant goes in, but the label is covering half of that. And then also, if you are using conventional visual, uh, conventional readout BIs that use a visual where you're looking at color change, also be aware that the conventional BIs on the market, uh, a, 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 a positive or failure may not just be color change, but also turbidity. So it's possible not to see a color change, but there's turbidity or cloudiness in the ampule that would signify a failure. So in your facility, if you have a conventional readout BIs, that depend on a visual. Are you also looking for turbidity and, 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 or cloudiness of the media? If you see cloudiness of it, that also potentially is a failure. Maybe there's a failure there that you haven't been seeing. All right, I'm right at the top of the hour. Um, so conclusion today. There are several options available for hydrogen peroxide uh, sterilization for healthcare facilities. Um, 
Uh, acceptable hydrogen peroxide cycles require passing physical, chemical, and biological indicator results. And, and artifacts of, of basic chemistry for vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization is that concentration levels uh, 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 deplete um, during exposure. And you can trend and manage your hydrogen peroxide sterilant levels in the chamber by understanding the levels reported on your cycle printouts and then following your manufacturer's instructions for use for the device for the packaging and for the sterilizer, all three of them follow those instructions for use for hydrogen peroxide sterilization and everything will be successful. All right, so trademarks and everything, just want to make sure we had that part of the slide. Uh, a lot of my references are all in there for some of these items and the stuff that I've mentioned. And so thank you uh, very much today for attending. Uh, again, I really appreciate everyone uh, in the healthcare field and what you're doing for us today. Uh, thank you. All right, Larry, thank you so much for a great presentation. I know we're a little bit over time, but I am going to ask you a couple of quick questions that came in. We've got some really great, great questions from the audience. The first question is, if a tray is not labeled for sterad, does it mean the items inside are not sterile? Oh, that's a, that's a, that, ooh, that's a really good question. I don't think I've had that one before. Um, ye, whoa, okay. Uh, so uh, on the pure scientific level of, of, of um, as a microbiologist, it, 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 you know, I, I, you, you couldn't say either way. I would um, take that question. That's a, wow, that's a phenomenal question. I can't believe after all these years I haven't got that. I would take that question to your sterilizer manufacturer um, if you're if you're if you're using steroid or ASP, I would take that question to ASP and, and, and get their response. So um, I could not tell you if it was sterile or not sterile, depending on the packaging, if it wasn't labeled. Um, but I would take that to your sterilizer manufacturer and or the packaging manufacturer and, and get their input on that one. But that's a great question. Wonderful. And one question, uh, should we be doing routine efficacy testing in both an empty chamber and a full chamber or just in a full chamber? Um, I would say just doing it in a full chamber for efficacy monitoring. Um, as you can see, where the operator uh, can dramatically affect the outcome of that process, um, you're just not challenging it appropriately with an empty chamber. So if you routine efficacy monitor in an empty chamber, it's just not appropriate. I would be doing it on a full chamber. Um, I, would, I would be doing it on every load because there are significant variables that change between loads and, and I would follow the preferred method for AME and ARN that say every load and every cycle. So if they say preferred every load and every cycle, that's very clearly that would be with a fully loaded chamber. Thank you so much for that answer. We are out of time. Everyone else who submitted a question, I will direct those questions to Larry to be answered via email. Thank you everyone for your participation. And Larry, thank you so much for providing this important information on vaporized hydrogen peroxide. We are going to transition in about 15 minutes to steam sterilization with Susan Flynn. So we'll see everybody shortly.